subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update. You will hear a woman calling the London Police Department to report a robbery. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, London Police Department. Yes, I would like to report a robbery. All right, just a minute while I pull up the form. OK, could you give me your first and last name? Anna Grieg. Anna Gregg. G-R-E-G? -E no, Grieg. G-R-I-E-G. -E Got it. All right, moving on. Gender. Female. Date of birth? 15th of March, 1980. All right, thanks. Just a few more personal information questions, and then we can address your claim. All right. What's the address? 4 Ellendale Street. That's E-L-L-E-N-D-A-L-E. -L -E -L -E. All right, Ellendale Street. Yeah. We've had a lot of break-ins in that area lately. And the postal code? W52AT. And are you a citizen of the UK? No. OK. What type of citizenship do you have? Well, I lived in the United States for most of my life, but I am actually of Grenadian nationality. OK. So is that the country that issued your passport? Yes. All right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. And what is the crime you're reporting? I already said a robbery. Oh, right. Sorry. This is about the hundredth robbery report I've filled out today. Have you had any prior break-ins? Um, in the building or just my flat? The unit below mine got broken into last year. No, just your flat. Oh, then no, not here. All right. Let's see here. Can you think of anything that was out of the ordinary around your building? or anyone who may have had reason to do this. No, it seemed like just a normal evening. I didn't see anyone suspicious and can't think of anyone that would target me specifically. How long has this been your place of residence? Hmm, let me think. I moved in on February 1st and it's October, so it's been about eight months already. Wow, time flies. And that is just for Ellendale, yeah? Yes. I have lived in the UK for just over one year. I see. Can you give me the first and last names of all members of the household? Actually, I live alone. OK, so no other occupants. And can you give me a brief account of what happened? I left to go to a dinner party at 6pm, and when I returned at 11, I found the place ransacked and a lot of my things gone. Any sign of forced entry? Yes, the back door was wide open, and it looked like someone used a crowbar to force it open. I see. And just to be clear, was the door locked when you left? Of course. Hey, you would be surprised how many reports we get where people have failed to lock their doors. Now, I need you to list any missing items valued above £200. So far, I'm missing my computer, my purse with my wallet in it, and the TV. OK, let's start with the computer. What is the estimated value? Five hundred pounds. And what is the serial number? G four one six eight seven seven zero. Thank you. And a visual description? It is a black thirteen inch PEMDAS cloud book. There is an Oxford sticker on the lid. Okay. And could you give me a description of the purse? Sure. It's a Claude Frieda shoulder bag and the material is silver coloured cloth. Price? Three hundred pounds. OK, that concludes my report. I'll submit it and we'll let you know of any developments.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. You'll hear Jane Hemmington talking about this year's summer festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening. And in this week's edition of Focus on the Arts, Jane Hemmington is going to fill us in on what's in store for us at this year's Summer Festival. Over to you, Jane. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, this year, the Summer Festival is the biggest we've ever seen, so there should be something for everybody. This is the third year they've run it, and the timing's slightly different. For the last couple of years, it's been around the 5th to 17th, but this year, they wanted to allow everyone enough time to recover from the 1st of January celebrations, and they've put it at the end of the month. The program has sensational theater, dance, and also a large number of art exhibitions. But the thing the festival is most famous for is its great street music. For today's report, though, Jeffrey, I'm looking at some of the theatrical events that you might like to see. In particular, at this year's theme, circuses. I'm going to uh, tell you about two circus performances, but there are plenty of others in the program. I've chosen these because they represent distinct movements within circus performance. The first is the Circus Romano from Italy. As this is a traveling circus, it follows a long tradition by performing in a marquee, which is really like a canvas portable building, usually put up in a green space or car park rather than in a theater or stadium. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. In spite of this, Circus Romano isn't at all like the traditional circuses I grew up with. There are no animals, just very talented clowning and acrobatic routines. The show has a lot of very funny moments, especially at the beginning. But the best part is the music and lighting. They're magical. At $45, it's very expensive anyway. Uh, it's really for adult tastes. In fact, much of it would be wasted on children, so I suggest you leave them at home. The second circus performance is Circus Electrica at the Studio Theater. The purists are suggesting that this isn't a circus at all. It's a showcase for skills in dance and magic rather than the usual ones you expect in a circus. With only six performers, it's a small production which suits the venue well. The studio only seats about 200 people. For my money, it's the aerial displays which are outstanding, as well as the magical tricks, features which are missing from Circus Romano. Uh, an interesting feature of the show is that the performers are so young. The youngest is only 14, but it's still well worth seeing. A good one for the whole family. And finally, as it's summer, you may wish to see some of the festival performances that are being presented outdoors, like the famous Mekong Water Puppet Troupe performing in the city gardens this week. Now, water puppetry is amazing. It's large puppets on long sticks, 
controlled by puppeteers standing waist deep in the lake. The puppets do comedy routines, and there is some terrific formation dancing. This is a fantastic show, and the best moment comes at the end, seeing the puppeteers. When the troupe walks up out of the water, you get this amazing feeling. It's really hard to believe that what you've been watching is lifeless wood and cloth. As an adult, I had a great time, but I did note that other older people in the audience weren't quite as taken with it as I was. It's a must for young children, though, and that's the audience it's really aimed at. Well, that's all I've time for today, but I'll be back next week with more news of what's worth seeing and what it's best to miss. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a conversation between three people about use of university computers. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello there, do you work in the computer room? Yes I do, can I help you? Well I'm a first year and I know that I'll need to use the computer room for my work as I don't have a computer of my own. So I thought I'd get down here and see what I have to do in order to get time on one of the university's computers. OK, uh, there are four computer labs open to undergraduates. The others can only be used by the staff and postgraduates. The names of the four labs you can use are Wimborne, Franklin, Salisbury and Court. Wimborne and Court are in this building, the Johnson Building. Franklin is in the Computer Sciences Building and Salisbury is in the Library. So I can use them whenever I like? Well, you can use them, but not whenever you like. As you can imagine, they're in quite a lot of demand so you have to reserve your time on a computer. In each of the labs, there is a reservation book, and you can reserve your time on a computer in that for two hours daily. If a computer is free, though, you can go on it straight away. It's quite straightforward, but be sure to always write your name in the reservation book in pen, or someone can rub it out and put their name in instead. Oh my God, does that really happen? I'm afraid so, and far more often than you would think. When people are stressed about their assignments, they'd do anything to get some time on the computers. Better not try it yourself, though, or you'll be banned from the computers for the rest of the academic year, and your password and username will be taken away. That reminds me, I've got to get a username and password. How do I go about that, then? Well, what I'll do is to pass you over to my colleague Jane, as she's in charge of all that. Jane? Yes, Dave? I've got a new student here wanting to find out about usernames and passwords. Can you help him out with that? Yeah, sure. Hi there. Hi. Well, it's a straightforward process. First of all, tell me your name and I'll type it into the system. James Smith. Right, let me do that. You see, all students are automatically given a username and then they just choose a password themselves. OK, so your username is James Smith 2 That's all small case. That means there must be more than one of you at the university at the moment. Well, what do you want your password to be? I think I'll choose biology, as that's the subject that I'm studying. Though my girlfriend Mary will be upset that it's not her name I'm using. Well, that's all done. You can now use any of the four undergraduate computer labs. By the way, can I print out stuff at the labs? Yes, you can, but sometimes it's not quick. When you print, it goes into a queue and it'll be left in a tray in Franklin, as that's where all the main printers are. The good bit is that, although last year it cost three pence per page, now it doesn't cost you anything. You now have some time to look at questions 28 to 30.
Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 28 to 30. I don't really know much about computing. Is there any training available? Yes, we have introductory courses for all new students. There is beginner, intermediate and advanced. Which would you like to go for? Well, I have done some, but I don't know if I'm up to anything more than beginner. I'd better stick with that. Intermediate could be too tough. Well, your course is in Franklin, then. We're in court now. You know where that is. That's in this building too, isn't it? No, that's Wimborne you're thinking about. Franklin's over in the Computer Sciences building. Anything else? I don't know what time the course starts. Let's have a look then. Advanced starts at 4.30 in the afternoon on Mondays, but yours is the day after at 5 in the afternoon. Are there any other times as I've got a part-time job then? Yes, you could try Thursday at 2pm. How's that? Even worse, as I have a tutorial then. Anything else? No, that's it. I'll have to rearrange work then. I can't miss the tutorial. You'll now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a presentation given by a sports science student on her project on left and right handedness in sport. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My topic is handedness. Whether in different sports it is better to be left or right-sided, or whether a more sports it is better to be left or right-sided, or whether a more balanced approach is more successful. I'm left-handed myself and I actually didn't see any relevance to my own life when I happened to start reading an article by a sports psychologist called Peter Matthews. He spent the first part of the article talking about handedness in music instead of sport, which I have to say almost put me off from reading further. But what I soon became struck by was the sheer volume of both observation and investigation he had done in many different sports, and I felt persuaded that what he had to say would be of real interest. I think Matthew's findings will be beneficial, not so much in helping sports people to work on their weaker side, but more that they can help them identify the most suitable strategies to use in a given game. Although most trainers know how important handedness is, at present they are rather reluctant to make use of the insights scientists like Matthews can give, which I think is rather short-sighted, because focusing on individual flexibility is only part of the story. Anyway, back to the article. Matthews found a German study which looked at what he called mixed handedness, that is, the capacity to use both left and right hands equally. It looked at mixed-handedness in 40 musicians on a variety of instruments. Researchers examined a number of variables. 
For example, type of instrument played, regularity of practice undertaken, and length of time playing instrument, and found the following. Keyboard players had high levels of mixed-handedness, whereas string players like cellists and violinists strongly favored one hand. Also, those who started younger were more mixed-handed. Matthews also reports studies of handedness in apes. Apes get a large proportion of fishing ants from anthills. The studies show that apes, like humans, show handedness, though for them right and left handedness is about equal, whereas about 85% of humans are right handed. Studies showed that apes consistently using the same hand fished out 30% more ants than those varying between the two. Matthew started researching several different sports and found different types of handedness in each. By the way, he uses handedness to refer to the dominant side for feet and eyes as well as hands. Anyway, his team measured the hand, feet, and eyes of 2,611 players and found that there were really three main types of laterality. Mixed, you work equally well on both sides, both hand and eye. Single, you tend to favor one side, but both hand and eye favor the same side. And cross laterality, a player's hands and eyes favor only one side, but they are opposite sides. Let's start with hockey. Matthews found that it was best to be mixed-handed. This is because a hockey stick must be de stick must be deployed in two directions. It would be a drawback to have hand or eye favoring one side. An interesting finding is that mixed-handed hockey players were significantly more confident than their single-handed counterparts. Things are slightly different in racket sports like tennis. Here, the important thing is to have the dominant hand and eye on the one side. This means that there is a bigger area of vision on most of the action occurs. If a player is cross-lateral, the racket is invisible from the dominant eye for much of the swing. It means that they can only make corrections much later, and often the damage has been done by then. And moving to a rather different type of sport, which involves large but precise movements, gymnastics. It's been found that cross-hand-eye favoring is best. The predominant reason for this is because it aids balance, which is, of course, absolutely central to performance in this sport. You now have half a minute to check your answers.